Sukho Sankasa Samagi. Happy is the harmony of the community. This is a really important principle as we practice together. And it requires a lot of cultural adjustments for us. The culture of a monastery is very different from the kind of culture we're accustomed to here in the States. Everything is voluntary. Everything is based on generosity. If you open your eyes and look around you, everything we have here in the sala is a result of somebody's gift. The land we walk on every day is a result of somebody's gift. And our practice should be a gift as well. So this is the atmosphere in which we practice. It's very different from the the dog, eat dog world out there, or the old American principle that if you don't get along with people, you just pick up and move. There's going to be a space for you someplace else. We want to practice here together, and we want to make our presence here not only good for our own practice, but also help for other people's practice too. And this involves learning how to create harmony. And John Lee has, an, has a simile. He says it's like a, a Thai orchestra. You have to have high-pitched instruments and low-pitched instruments and middle-pitched instruments for it to sound good. In other words, you're going to be dealing with all different kinds of people here. Some people come simply because they want to make merit. Other people come because they want to meditate. Some people come with really skillful intentions, others with just barely skillful intentions. And we have to learn how to make it work. And you can take a John Lee's analogy here and expand it a little bit further. Think about the difference between Western classical music and Thai classical music. In the West, we have orchestras with a conductor, and the conductor is really in charge. Not only keeps the beat, but also basically shapes the whole sound of the orchestra. And the best orchestras are the ones where the conductor tends to be a really forceful personality, and who can keep everybody in line. Of course, the really good ones know also how to make everyone want to play together. But the bottom line is that there's a set score based on what somebody wrote sometime in the past, and that's simply a matter of interpretation of the score, but you don't want to get away from the score. And you've got the conductor in charge. Thai classical music is very different. The conductor does only one thing, keeps the beat. Actually sits in the back. And each section of music has a basic tune, but nobody's supposed to play the tune as it's actually written. In fact, if everybody played in unison, it would be considered a really dumb orchestra and not interesting at all. You're supposed to elaborate. And part of the elaboration means leaving out certain notes or pulling the, the beat a little bit here and there and then catching up playing a little bit before, playing a little bit after, and listening to everybody else in the orchestra. And many times you'll find in the orchestra that somebody's not there that day, that their child is sick or something else is going on, so they have to make up for the missing members sometimes. Or if one member of the orchestra is kind of weak, everybody else will do their part to pick up the slack. In other words, you're not just focused on the music and the conductor, you're also focused on listening to everybody else and seeing what needs to be added.
then the art of improvisation is an important part of it. And life in a monastery is very much like a Thai classical orchestra. Sometimes certain instruments are missing today. So we have to make up for the lack. Or if someone's got a really good improv going, or you want to step back a little bit into the background. And if nobody else has one going, well, you can come to the fore. In other words, you listen to each other and figure out what needs to be done, what's lacking. And your own powers of improvisation have to come in as well. So think of that as you go through the day here in the monastery. So look around you. As a John Lee once said, when you live in a monastery, your eyes have to be as big as the monastery. Your ears have to be as big as the monastery. In other words, everybody has to learn how to encompass the whole picture. And if one member of the orchestra is a little weak, well, you don't push the person out. You just make allowances. So think about this as you go through the day. They were all here with a, because of a quality of what the Thai is called Nam Jai, which is heart. Literally, it's translated translated as heart water or heart juice. It's the nourishing quality of the heart that makes us want to practice. But we all come with varying levels of understanding, various varying levels of commitment. Some people are really eager to learn. Other people will they're just barely here. And so you want to have to learn how to help nourish everybody else's heart juice and not make it dry up. So that means learning also how to cultivate your own. Because when you learn how to cultivate the attitude of doing what needs to be done, you start learning how to deal with your own defilements. And the better you are at dealing with your own defilements, the better you are at dealing with other people's defilements as well. One of the lessons I learned from my father is that there are a lot of jobs in the world that nobody wants to do. And that's your great opportunity for making merit. I remember very vividly one time when I was small, the cesspool in the house where we were living, out on the farm there in Long Island, was getting full. So Dad went down and he dug a new cesspool. Now his problem was he dug the new cesspool too close to the old one, and the wall of dirt between the two of them collapsed on him. And he never complained. Got up and just washed himself off, and we had a bigger cesspool. And even after we left the farm, every weekend was devoted to doing whatever chores needed to be done around the house. No matter how difficult, no matter how dirty, that was the kind of work he did. And you notice nobody was competing with him to do that work. It was a wide open field. And I discovered when I went to Thailand that that attitude was perfect for living in a Thai monastery. Especially when we're in Ryong, where sometimes we had only you know, two or three monks, one or two lay people, but there was a whole monastery to look after. And on the one hand, John Fuen kept saying that the, the internal monastery, and he was playing, a, playing with the words in Thai, there's the word wat, which means monastery, but wat also means your, your daily duties, your daily practice i.e. of meditation. So he said, well, look after the internal what first, and then the external what comes after. So on the one hand, we want to make sure that our own internal practice is what stays at the center of everything here. But there are times when you really have to give a lot of effort to the external what. So then you have to figure out okay, what needs to be done, what doesn't need to be done. Especially at periods like right now, where we're down to a very few people. Look around you and see what needs to be done. 
And if there's too much to do in a single day, we'll figure out what needs to be done today and what can be put off to tomorrow. Learn how to read the situation. It's like being a member of that Thai orchestra. Just listen to who's missing. Well, like Korean classical music, I was a drummer one time for a kayakum player. And being a drummer wasn't just keeping the beat. You had to vary how many extra strokes you would put, say, on a particular beat. Some beats required sounded best if you didn't hit the drum, and other beats sounded better when you did. But what was really important was that the kayagam was had its very set tune, and there were parts where on the downbeat the kayagam wouldn't play. And that's where, as I told, the drummer always had to play. You never wanted an empty downbeat. If there were times when the kayagam was playing on the downbeat, it wasn't necessary. You could vary the rhythm. It sounded better when you played around that way. Well, the same principle applies here. Look around and see what needs to be done. Who is missing the downbeat? And be alive to the fact that sometimes people who have a regular job, but we've we sort of divided it up among ourselves, who does what. Sometimes they have a heavier job than normal, and they might appreciate a helping hand. So life in the monastery is like improv, and improv requires that you be very alert which, of course, is excellent practice for the meditation. Learn how to read the situation around you, and it helps in your skill in reading the situation inside. Because the same principle happens in the mind. The defilements in your mind don't come in line with any score. They come willy-nilly. Some days are a lot, some days are not that many. And you have to be up for whatever the situation requires. This is what, what right effort is all about. Some issues come up in the mind that require a lot of effort and a lot of thought. Others require just that you watch, and they go away on their own. So you have to learn a sensitivity to what needs to be done inside. And remember that the practice of meditation is not a military exercise or a mechanical exercise. It's improv. So the two skills should help each other along, learning how to improvise inside and learning how to improvise outside. That's what leads to harmony. Always keep the principle of harmony in mind.